Hi there, and welcome to another edition of the 1% Better Podcast with your host, Rob O'Donoghue. Hey folks, welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. Glad to have you along. One that I've been looking forward to releasing for a while as my guest is an absolute gentleman and has amazing experience, Dermot Mannion. Huge experience in the aviation industry. I'll talk a little bit more about Dermot just in a minute or two. Just a few quick call outs. Donna Taggart's episode last week, the Celtic musician and singer, has gone down very well. She has a huge following and... She's on Facebook with something like half a million follows on her page. She has over 150 million social media views of her music. And she's doing a UK tour at the moment. We talk about her own developing self-belief, growing in self-confidence, talent and hard work. It was a really good shorter episode that I shared last week. So do check it out. Put it on to your list of things to, to listen to. I'd appreciate that. Really good news on the new podcast front the 864 show will officially launch to the masses sometime late next week i'm probably going to release about four episodes at once the 864 is a shorter episode but still full of useful information and i have some special international and nationally well-known guests ready to go all recorded and ready to to go but the first two episodes are actually now available on the patreon site so that's patreon and go to rob of the green on patreon you can subscribe there you can hear the intro show which is about 10 minutes long me talking about what it's all about and the first episode the first interview and that's with mike mccallavich he is an author he's a wall street journal columnist and he is a podcaster and he's from the US and has been very successful over the last number of years writing books around making profit, entrepreneurship and lots more besides. So those two are on Patreon now to be more added over the weekend and I'll start rolling out next week. I'd love if you subscribed. I hope you subscribe to the new show. Lots of more information will come around that. Do check out the One Minute Monday videos. They're continuing. Probably going to take a break on those once I hit 10, which is uh, next week. One of them a couple of weeks ago has some like, I don't know, 8,000 views which is great to see and the topic on that one is more around mental health and giving yourself space and doing some exercise I think it resonates with a lot of people so I would say check that out on the website it's on the video link if you go to robertagreen.ie and the video button I will just call out that I still offer if you listen to the end of the podcast there's a couple of minutes section where I talk about everything that's going on and I do offer a couple of hours a month free coaching pro bono coaching so if you have an interest in that do reach out and I'd be happy to chat with you provided I have the the time and uh, I do square away some time every month for that and on the topic of coaching that's where I can move to this week's guest that is Dermot Mannion Dermot was the former CEO of Erlingus one of his roles on his career journey so far he also was the deputy chairman with Royal Brunei Airlines he was a president of group services at Emirates and now runs his own consulting business and coaching business and and it's coaching where I got to know Dermot both he and I did a IMI executive coaching diploma a couple of years back and from there we were able to get to know each other and I was around the time of the end of that course released the podcast and was delighted that Dermot agreed to come on to the show unfortunately couldn't do it last year but we're doing it now and I am really excited to share the conversation Dermot's experience comes massively through on the show we talk about listening skills leadership coaching mentoring developing and nurturing talent so much more Dermot is an absolute gentleman and I was so excited to spend an hour listening myself to his story and I'm sure very confident that you will really take something away from this the guy has a glittering career and it's still going and yeah I think you will really enjoy it if you do please do let me know I'd love to hear feedback on it what stood out for you also please do keep an eye out on the socials for updates on the 864 that will be coming over the next few days with the full official launch next week if you do want to hear it in advance i would love to have you as a subscriber on patreon to help support all the stuff that i'm doing on this podcast and the 864 and i think there'll be no one percent better podcast next week and probably the following week as i release a bunch of episodes for the 864 so you'll need to subscribe to that so i shall leave it there i am delighted to introduce the conversation with dermot Mannion. please do enjoy and have a great weekend thanks so much and good luck Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the 1% Better Podcast. And this one I am 
extremely delighted to welcome Dermot Mannion to the podcast. Dermot, thanks for coming on to the show. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. Greetings to you and greetings to all your listeners as well. So this one was, uh, Dermot, I think one I wanted to, to certainly get into season one and we just couldn't make it happen. And now I'm into season two and delighted to, to get you on and want to talk a bit about your career. I guess for context, we met at a coaching program or coaching diploma that we did um, together in the IMI last year. And for me, that was a, a massively life-changing experience in lots of ways. Coaching, for me, I've learned so much about it over the last year, met, met so many nice people along the, the journey that we, I guess, been on together. For you, coaching, was that something that you were always interested in knowing more about um and was it just the perfect time to, to do that diploma i'd love to know a little bit of background around coaching and where it's kind of been a, pl- a player in your career i suppose coaching and mentoring uh, is something that i've been very keen on uh, through all of my professional life and uh, my main reason for completing the diploma last year at the imi is that I suppose it gives you a sort of a nomenclature to better describe things that I was doing already in my career mm. over many years. So in, in, in a professional sense, uh, what I have found most satisfying uh, in the various roles that I've had in the airline industry and elsewhere over the years is in watching and nurturing and developing young talent. And uh, completing the course, uh, as I said, at IMI last year, uh, just gave a a sort of academic framework to go with that, which I found very, very useful. And indeed, since uh, then, I've been uh, using many of the techniques uh, more extensively now, because these days I spend more time coaching and mentoring people, not just from within the industry that I'm most familiar with, Mm -hmm. but also from people, you know, from right across the spectrum of various other industrial sectors as well. Mm, brilliant. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking a little bit more about about that. And and just to, to talk a bit about you know your career, I did some research. I knew some of it already, and on others, when I do a bit of research for these episodes, it's great to to get a bit of information about people's backstory. Your career started with Ulster Bank, and, and you worked with Emirates for 15 or 16 years, and then you became the CEO of Aer Lingus, then Royal Brunei Airlines. I think as chairman, deputy chairman. So there's been a lot of big roles, I suppose, during that that period. One question that just come up as you as you talked about coaching and how how you always were keen to develop young talent. Did you have a coach or did you have somebody that was your mentor or keen to develop you along along your journey? And do you think that's why you have such a passion for doing the same? I believe that's a very fair point. I, I think anybody who achieves any level of success in life in whatever their sphere of influence, I, I think would be honest enough to admit that to get there, you need some help along the way. And, and I certainly had a, a significant amount of help in, in, in my career. For instance, I spent a long number of years working for Emirates Airline uh, in Dubai. Mm. And at that particular time, uh, the chief executive was a man called Morris Flanagan, who went on to become Sir Morris Flanagan because he was knighted for his service mm. to the industry. And indeed, rightly so. But uh, he was the boss, and uh, he was uh, had a significant influence over me in those years. And the thing that I admired about him most was that he was prepared to take a chance on somebody that he felt had ability. For instance, in my case, I was just a young, qualified accountant who came in working in the treasury area of the airline. Right. And I got to know the CEO because of various aircraft uh, acquisition transactions that we were involved in. He obviously liked what I was doing and my approach, and he could see that there was some ability there that could be nurtured. And he had the foresight to, I suppose, pull me out of that role and bring me across other uh, aspects of the business, which uh, really was a very brave and innovative thing to do on his part. Mm. And uh, I hope I repaid the confidence uh, over the years, uh, the, he, he's dead and gone now. God rest right. his soul. He died just two years ago. Okay. But he was a, a very significant influence in my career, and he was a very remarkable man. There are many senior aviation people running around the world today who learned everything they know about the industry from Sir Morris Flanagan. Wow, 
that's uh, certainly somebody I must look 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 into. What was it that was so outstanding, I suppose, about him, or what were the skills or style of management leadership that he had that you thought really set him apart? He was a very humble guy, and he listened to people. You know, listening is such a huge uh, attribute in good leadership because if you're not listening then really you're not getting the pulse of the organization. He was very good, for instance, at attending a meeting where there could be quite a few you know, senior executives in the organization sitting around the table. He would listen very keenly mm. to what each of them had to say. And he was very good at forming a picture of the type of person that he was interacting with. And he certainly had the skill and the ability, it seems to me, to maybe identify people, you know, like myself, who are working in a very narrow sphere of influence and say, you know what, I think we can put you to work elsewhere. And that's exactly what he did. So I think good listening skills Mm. and humility uh, are very, very important uh, leadership uh, skills. Well, yeah. And I guess um, this is probably 20, 30 years ago when when you interacted with him and maybe the leadership style then might have been considered more, you know, extroverted and loud and pushy. It sounds like he was almost the opposite. And I know now nowadays we hear a lot of like leaders speak last sort of statements going out there. Was that the type? Was he was he was he introverted? Was he more of a, an extrovert? Well, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, I would describe him as as a quiet family man, really, uh, away from from the work environment. And quite shy in many ways. Uh, he didn't necessarily like um, the public profile too much. He, he preferred interacting with people in, in, in smaller groups. But I think your point is well made. I think he was ahead of the curve because in those days, if you go back 20 years, especially in the airline industry, now bear in mind that a lot of ex-military people end up in, in aviation. Yeah. So there, there tended to be a very military-style autocracy right. in various organizations. And, uh, you know, Sir Morris Flanagan was the antithesis of that. He was a very collegiate uh, type of guy. And he, um, he certainly got the best out of the people around him. And, and I learned enormous lessons from him in that respect. Mm, it's cool. And especially the tie between listening and coaching obviously we know it's one of the most important things you could do as a coach is to to listen so that's uh that's interesting i'd like to dig into the aviation industry originally from sligo grew up there went to school there was aviation on your radar that's a pun that i didn't even plan to do but was that something that was uh in your mind always or did it something to just kind of fall into as you got into the working world well it's funny because i i remember a strange incident where uh, a cousin of mine uh, and I, with, with whom I was very close when I was much younger, um, in, a, in I think I was 10 or 11 years old on one occasion, and he just happened to turn around to me and say, for no apparent reason, you know, something along the lines of, you know what, you should work for Aer Lingus because it's the best way to travel the world if you can get into that organization. Right. And I thought I thought about that, you know, probably 30 years later, uh, when I ended up coming back from Dubai in 2005 to join Aer Lingus. And, and it was just a strange uh, memory from the past and how prescient he was mm. that uh, who, who would have said in all those years ago, that 35 years later, I would end up coming back and joining Aer Lingus. And everything he said was true because if you do want to experience different parts of the world, different cultures, then certainly the airline industry is, is a very good one to, to, to work in. But was, so that was the only real, uh, I suppose, connection to the airline industry that I had for, for my earlier years. I mean, I, I as you said, I, I went to school in Sligo. I then went off to university at, at Trinity College, which actually in the 70s was quite an experience. I was one of the first students, I think it's fair to say, or the first part of the first wave of students, if you like, from the west of Ireland to, to attend Trinity. Because up to that point, Trinity was a very Dublin-centric uh, university. And after that, uh, I spent a couple of years uh, in, in banking for the, uh, the Ulster Bank Group. And in fact, that's where I first became exposed to aviation activity. The Ulster Bank uh, people were lending money into the aircraft leasing companies. I got involved in a little bit of that activity. It gave me a taste for it. And uh, there's a saying in our industry that once you get the smell of 
jet fuel in your nostrils. There's no turning back. And that was very much the case for me. Very good. Um, so when you were growing up in Saigo, what was your ambition? What was something that you thought, this is what I'd love to do when I grow up? Well, I wanted to go out into the world. Uh, I, I think it's an Irish thing. I'm often asked, actually, especially internationally, why are there so many Irish people in aviation? And I think it has something to do with the fact that we live in a small island nation. And for that reason, as a, 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 as a nationality, Irish people tend always to look outwards because we're always looking to see what's happening in other parts of the world and we're very keen to have that experience. So I, I think it's not uncommon in Ireland for people to have a fascination with the airline industry. And I suppose, yes, there was an element of that uh, when I was growing up, but it was really only uh, all those years later, as I said, when I joined Aer Lingus that I could kind of see a certain uh, thread, if you like, that went all the way back to my childhood and uh, realizing uh, perhaps for the first time that there was a fascination there all the time with the industry that I hadn't quite focused on all that much when I was young. Right. When you were f focusing hard on studies in primary school, secondary school and, and got into Trinity, was what were, I suppose, the the strengths that you were aware of that you had at the time? Obviously, in the finance game, was that an area of passion for you? I, I felt finance was, was a good stepping stone, right. uh, which I think it turned out to be. I, I think these days, uh, anyone who wants to be successful in the corporate world needs to understand the numbers. So, you know, whether you come from an engineering background or a HR background or whatever it might be, I think uh, certainly as you get promoted to uh, higher levels within an organization, there is certainly an expectation of understanding the numbers. So I felt that um, I wanted to qualify as an accountant, but then go and use that in an industrial uh, setting. I certainly didn't see myself. Uh, spending the rest of my life uh, working as an accountant. I wanted to branch out from that, I suppose, and use the technical skills that I had acquired to go and do something in a more general management area. The discipline around finance and numbers is, is probably left brain. I talk a bit about that, the left brain and the right brain. And then as you get into more leadership and management, you're probably using more softer skills. Would you have seen a, a kind of a balance between those as you were stepping out into your early career? Did you have a natural ability to, to manage people and interface with, with uh, your team and that? I, I've always liked the soft side. Uh, so I always enjoy, you know, the human interaction side. And if I'm honest, the thing that I found most difficult about my early career when I was, you know, going through the meat grinder of trying to qualify as an accountant is that it can be a very solitary pursuit. I mean, it's basically you and the numbers and your ability to analyze the data and so on. And there isn't that much human interaction. That side of it, I, I didn't enjoy. And I suppose I made the decision early on that, you know, once I get the analytical ability under my belt in this area of numbers, then I'm going to quickly move on and, you know, get out there into the big, bad world and start interacting with people. And that was, I suppose, the first big role within Ulster Investment Bank. Was that the, the first one after college? Well, yes, I, I joined there. Well, first of all, uh, I finished at Trinity. Mm. Then I went into one of the big four accounting firms and okay. uh, I spent a three year apprenticeship there, which is what one did in those days. And I guess they're still doing it now. Mm -hmm. uh, to qualify as an accountant. And then after that, right. uh, I spent uh, two years uh, on the lending side at uh, Ulster Investment Bank. And as I mentioned, that's where I became really first significantly interested anyway, I would say, in pursuing a career in aviation. Just to even step back on one thing, I remember when I was, I'm originally from Longford, uh, as, you, as you probably know, and uh, when I was 17, I, I took the, the journey from Longford to the DCU actually at the time, and uh, that was in the mid-90s, I was completely probably out of my depth for, for a while and ended up leaving college in Dublin, went to Galway then and did four years. What was what was your early experiences of even just moving from Sligo to Dublin? Obviously, I imagine exciting. Was it daunting? Was there memories that stuck out that to, to form who Dermot was as a, a young adult? That's a very good question, Rob. If I look back on it, I really was an innocent country boy coming up to Dublin right. in those years. I, I'd be the first to admit it. 
And I probably spent the first three out of my four years in Trinity being somewhat overwhelmed by the place. I mean, all the other students around me, especially those from Dublin, just seemed to be so much more in tune with the place than I was. Mm. But um, so for sure, it was, a, you know, in, in terms of, of, of challenge, it was a significant step up for me. And I remember so well, most of my friends from the Northwest did what you eventually did, which was uh, going to university in Galway, right? Uh, where they had all of that, you know, camaraderie and, and uh, you know, Galway has that great party town reputation, as I'm sure you well know. <laughs> Too well. And, you know, Tr Trinity is, is a big city university and uh, it was challenging. So uh, no doubt about it, um, in those years, uh, it was uh, a difficult experience, but ultimately a very rewarding one. And there were some very interesting people to be found around the campus of Trinity in the years that I was there. I mean, Joe Duffy, for instance, now of RTE, yeah. was the president of the Students' Union in my time. Wow. And I, I remember uh, Jerry Ryan, sadly no longer with us, uh, also of, of RTE. I remember he was head of the, the Law Society, the Student Law Society in Trinity in my time. And you had, you know, people like uh, now former President Mary McAleese, who was a, a lecturer in the law department. So it was a fascinating place to be. And I wouldn't have missed it for the world. But yes, absolutely, it had its challenges. I think one of the challenges I had was was just a lack of confidence and and can you allude to maybe the the uh, more outgoing extroversion of of some of the locals versus to you coming from the country um was that a challenge did or did your confidence slowly come do you remember any times when you started almost feeling at home and you know you you weren't longing to go home for the weekend sort of thing and you felt well this is uh, it? yeah again a very good question uh, my sense is that i really began to feel comfortable in the place when it was getting time to leave actually if i'm honest it was in that fourth year yeah i really began to feel you know having a beer in, in the buttery bar and and uh, and all of that and the pavilion bar and uh, you know just enjoying the ambience and the lifestyle i mean it's, trinity is a unique university i mean there you are right in the center of the city i mean in my final year for instance I lived in college. I had, uh, you know, rooms that were overlooking College Green, which was fantastic. Mm. So I really enjoyed kind of that experience of it. Uh, but I suppose it did take me a good three years, I think, looking back to really fully assimilate in, into the uh, institution and to really begin to get the benefit of it. But mm. certainly the last year uh, was very memorable and I enjoyed it enormously. Brilliant, yeah, no, sounds sounds really cool. And some of those names that you mentioned, I suppose, obviously at the time there were just other students like y yourself, and it must be interesting to kind of track their trajectories as they've kind of grown and developed over the the last number of years. And well, it it is. I remember listening to Joe Duffy then, and I think he's repeated it since, saying that as, as, uh, as far as I recall, he claims to have been the first person from Ballyfermot to walk through the gates of uh, Trinity as a student, and I think that may well be the case. <laughs> good claim to fame for sure maybe just jump forward a little bit when you took the role w with emirates was that immediately a move to dubai and this was this was what the in, in the mid 80s dubai i've seen pictures of of what dubai looked like 30 years ago versus what it looks like now was that must be another massive change for you it, it was and um you know because at that particular time uh, dubai was nowhere near as developed or as cosmopolitan as it is now however I did have a sense when I first visited the place that this city is really going to go somewhere right. and grow. And also my sense of, of Emirates and having met the people associated with Emirates was that, you know, this was an organization that, uh, because Emirates only started life in 1985. Right. Uh, which is relatively recent in aviation terms. Sure. But my, my sense is that the way they went about building the organization, bringing expertise from different parts of the world, that really they could create uh, something very special. And that's largely down to, you know, Sir Morris Flanagan, who was the first initial uh, CEO of the organization and who remained there for, for more than 30 years. So I suppose I saw that in the early stages. And although the city... Uh, wasn't tremendously well developed in those days. It was still a very comfortable 
and a very interesting place to live. Mm. And uh, I suppose I took a bet on, uh, you know, the, the potential for expansion and growth. And I think that worked out rather well. I mean, when I joined Emirates, for instance, in 85, the airline had two aircraft. When I left in 2005, they had uh, 90 aircraft. And today the figure is probably heading towards 300 aircraft. It's a remarkable story in aviation terms. And, you know, just being there for those years was like, a, you know, experiencing a, a, a real time PhD course in the industry. Absolutely. Yeah. Learning so much, I, I'd imagine. What, when you were, there, were you there for about 15 more years? I was there for 15 plus years. Indeed, I was. Yeah. And, and it's looking back now, it seems to have passed in, in a flash. But yes, it was more than 15 years. Is there any standout moments during that time? I like to ask questions where you've maybe there was a big success and something that you're very proud of maybe during that. But also maybe was there anything that jumped up saying that I made a I made a mistake or two here that you've taken the most learning from? Anything come up for you there? Oh, gosh, I made plenty of mistakes uh, along the way. I remember at one point, um, I mean, as I said, fa finance was very much my background. But at, at one stage, uh, they asked me, perhaps unwisely, to take over the management of the IT department as well. <laughs> uh, because at that particular time, and indeed you see it now in many organizations, there is a um, there tends to be a natural connection between finance and IT. So yeah. they created a single senior management position and they said to me, we now want you to be responsible for finance and IT as well. And boy, did I find IT a tough nut to crack. I mean, it's... You know, it, for the uninitiated, that is an extremely difficult area to manage. Mm. And I remember, for instance, going into uh, meetings of the IT department and sitting there and listening. And IT people, you know, are, are very jargon focused. So they will be trading jargon across the table that a non-technical person simply wouldn't understand. And uh, I suppose one of the mistakes I made was that I didn't stop that process sooner than, than I did. For, for instance, in the initial stages, I thought, you know what, I need to go away, get a handle on all of this jargon and nomenclature stuff myself so that I can, you know, jump into meetings and participate in these kind of discussions. Yeah. But instead of doing that, what I really should have done in meeting one was say, stop this now. I don't want any more jargon in this meeting. I want you to explain things in the way that you would explain it to a non-technical person and to do it in a couple of sentences. And once I started doing that, it was enormously effective because actually what you discovered after a bit mm. was that in the IT game, and I suspect in other professions as well, if they're not entirely sure of their own subject matter, they bury it in jargon <laughs> so that they can disguise it from others in the organization. So asking the dumb question is often the most intelligent thing to do. And it's one of the greatest lessons that I've picked up is never, ever be afraid to ask what you think might be perceived to be a stupid question. There are no stupid questions, and you can often get some very remarkable and very meaningful answers. That's really uh, insightful. I, I'm, IT is my background as well, and uh, I remember the, the term I, suppose I might have used 10 years ago or more was blinding people with science almost because... When yeah, when you couldn't explain it properly, you throw throw some stuff that could um, bamboozle the person to kind of get yourself off the hook. But the other thing comes up for me there is what we probably took out of coaching is this bringing a beginner's mind to two things, and it, it seems to tie in nicely with what what you said there. So so really really good good advice. Was there on the flip side of that? So Dermot, a, a a really big success story, something that you were proud of during those years, apart from just. You know, the, the whole the whole thing probably was a big success, but was there one or two things jumping out? Well, I, first of all, it was, it was a great privilege to be part of the development of a growing airline like that. And, mm. You know, it gave one access to, you know, contract situations with new aircraft and new technology, which was very much at the cutting edge of the industry, which I, I really enjoyed. But I, I think the thing that's given me most satisfaction over the years is... Um, is really uh, uh, expanding from what we've just been talking about, moving away from people just using jargon to try and explain their way out of difficult situations. 
what I've tried to do over the years is take talented people, whether they might be from IT or finance or indeed any other department of the organization, and get them to think in a way you know, of presenting the technical material that they have, but do it in a way that they could stand in front of the board of directors, none of whom would have any technical knowledge on a particular subject. Mm. And, you know, in 20 slides on a PowerPoint presentation, you know, give them, non-experts, an explanation of what's going on and get their support. And it's been very edifying for me over the years to watch, you know, young, smart managers that I've developed you know, getting to that point where they can walk in with confidence to a board meeting, present, you know, perhaps a very significant project for the organization with a very significant capital investment, do it in a way that non-technical people can understand, and at the end of it all, get the project approved. That's a very, uh, a very pleasant experience when it happens, and that's something I've seen quite a bit of in my career. Mm. I'm interested on that. Did there's the whole debt by PowerPoint, as you rightly said, you want to try and keep those slides to the to the minimal. But have you like developed almost like a process for exactly what you described, getting those presentations in front of leadership and getting approval without overcomplicating things? Is there any key things that you would do along along the kind of journey of getting that from A to Z? It, it, your point about PowerPoint is a good one. I think we're all somewhat ambivalent about PowerPoint. I mean, the, the danger about PowerPoint is that you can make uh, something look an awful lot better than it actually is in a PowerPoint presentation if you've got good presentation skills. And I think, you know, uh, senior executives and board members and CEOs are very alive to that. You know, some smart young guy who comes in with a very slick, very brief, very short uh, PowerPoint presentation, but but actually it's disguising a whole bunch of problems that really should have been articulated. So there is that danger with PowerPoint, and you've certainly got to to, to guard against it. But on the other hand, though, um, when it's used effectively, it's an incredibly powerful tool. I mean, I I have I, I'm very keen on things like, for instance, on a particular slide, uh, you should not. Uh, crowd it with, uh, with too many words and, and, and too many graphics and so on. Each slide should be designed to convey a very simple, very straightforward uh, message. And if you can do that, then, you know, by the end of a 15 or 20 slide presentation on most projects, however complex they might be, in my experience, you can generally get the main points in there and at least begin the process of getting support from whoever it is that you're you're presenting to. So it's it's a very powerful tool, and properly managed can be very very effective in, in my experience. And one of the other uh, seminal lessons uh, that I had is that my early years in Emirates, um, at that time the airline was owned by the government of Dubai, as it still is, and occasionally when we were involved in acquisition transactions for new aircraft, we would have to brief various government departments and government advisors on what we were doing. And there was one particular uh, government advisor who would insist that any project that you would bring to him had to be summarized uh, to his satisfaction on one sheet of A4 paper. And the challenge with that is that it, you know, if you have to summarize the key elements in that brief space, it tests you to make absolutely sure that you understand what are the really critical factors in this particular project. The danger with PowerPoint is that if you're not too sure what the key factors are, you, you, know, you simply put them all down on the slide, jumble the thing up and hope that somewhere in this morass people will, will reach the right conclusions. Whereas if you're forced to summarize it in a much shorter space, it really does you know, separate the, the, the wood from the trees. And at the end of that, it's pretty easy to determine whether whoever's doing the presenting actually knows their stuff or not. So brevity, in my experience, has been, you know, is very, very important. Mm, yeah, I like it. The, the, one, the, the idea of a one-page business case is something 
been asked to do in in the past and sometimes uh challenge of it obviously is is as you said to get it down to the brass tacks and make it as impactful as possible you, you could spend a whole week working on a single one page presentation <laughs> that that's how tricky it is yeah. but at the end of it if you can distill it and get it down into a single page um you know you will look at it and say you know what this really does get to the essence of this. And it's a very, very effective tool and a very effective technique. Now, with PowerPoint, of course, people tend, as we've discussed, to, to go for more rather than less, which I think is a mistake. In my experience, if you go beyond 20 slides on PowerPoint, especially if they're very busy slides, I think you're going to lose the attention of your audience very, very quickly. Good one. You mentioned culture earlier on, as in you wanted to experience new cultures. When you moved to Dubai, obviously a new culture in your lifestyle, but also the culture of the organization. I suppose how 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 had you influenced to that or see that develop over the years and even subsequently in your other roles? How important, I guess, has, has culture been? I think it's critical. I mean, you really have to understand the dynamics of the people that you're dealing with. And the only way you do that, of course, is is by listening. I mean, my, my most recent uh, new cultural experience was when I went to the Far East for the first time five years ago, as you mentioned earlier, to take up the role of deputy chairman of, of Royal Brunei Airlines, an experience that, that I found tremendously I- I- enriching. It was my first experience of operating in the Far East. Um, I spent my initial period uh, listening to the people around me, the Bruneian nationals who worked in the airline. Uh, and over the time that I was there, um, I developed a, a tremendous affection for the people in that part of the world, for their honesty, for their integrity, for their great uh, kindness, and also for their for their ability uh, in, in, in Brunei, as in many other countries in the Far East. There's a tremendous emphasis on education. All of the young people are hungry for knowledge. They all go to the best universities that they can afford. And when they join organizations and uh, they go into work, they're very, very keen right across the Far East to learn, especially from expat managers like myself Mm. who would come in. And it was just a great joy to work with them, uh, see them develop over the period, and especially see the creativity that I saw in in that part of the world uh, during my time. But again, you can only appreciate that and you can only develop an understanding of that by observing and listening uh, to the people around you. And in the end, it's all about, I think, creating a space where the people that you're interacting with can be as creative as they can possibly be in that organization at that particular time. And and that's certainly what I've aimed to achieve anywhere that I've been over the years. That's, that's fascinating. A lot of times when a new leader takes on a role, and you know, even in your previous roles, there's maybe an expectation to shake things up and in your first 100 days make some sort of statement or quick wins. And from what you're saying, it sounds like you take a more of a measured approach and listen and learn and feel that you need to get things clear in your own mind before you would make any changes. Would, would that be fair to say? And, and does that add extra pressure almost because you're not doing what everybody else might be doing? That's a very good uh, question, actually, and, and not something that perhaps I've given a great deal of thought to. Uh, the, the one thing I would say is that everything somebody in a position of authority does sends a message to the people around them. Mm. So, for instance, uh, you know, in joining, for, when I went to Brunei, it's absolutely true that I did spend a significant amount of, of the early days listening to what was going on. But just presenting yourself as being in listening mode, going around the organization, attending meetings, interacting with people, that in itself is sending a huge message. Absolutely. You may not be going out making any dramatic statements of intent in terms of which way we're going to drive the business, but just presence is is a hugely important issue and people value uh, being listened to people value the fact that you go around the organization and interact with them uh, in their places of work in the different departments in in, an airline whether it's at the airport or whether it's in the engineering building or whether it's in the IT 
infrastructure area, whatever it might be. People really welcome those kind of visits because they, they, they feel open to discussing the problems. What are the real issues in the business? So just doing that sends a very powerful message, which is often strong enough to carry you way beyond the first 100 days. No, I can I can imagine it does. And it, it takes a lot of confidence or self-confidence or self-belief as well, I'd imagine, not to be pressured into making those, uh, you know, f- fast knee-jerk decisions, maybe until you have a good sense of the lie of the land. And I presume that's just come with experience. Well, I, I'll go back to one very good piece of advice that I was given by a wise manager in my Ulster Investment Bank days that's who said good. to me one time, that the first thing to do in a crisis is nothing. I like it. And I, I think that fits the bill perfectly for what you've just said. Hmm. You're absolutely right. We live in a world of knee-jerk reactions. We live in a world of social media, instant feedback, and all those things. Mm-hmm. And you know, nobody uh, is going to be given 100 days anymore to think about anything unless they really fight for it. Sure. So uh, it is absolutely challenging, there's no doubt. But at the same time, it's much better to make no decision than a bad decision. So yes, it does require a certain amount of confidence, a certain amount of self-belief. Uh, I think in my case, um, I simply said, you know, the airline at that particular time at, in Brunei was facing challenges, as many other airlines around the world were. And my view was that it was going to take at least six months to begin to figure out how to move it forward. And yes, it was a battle to get that six months, but I think we eventually got there. And, you know, once we got close to the six month period and once the board and the senior management began to see a climate of positive change in the organization, then I think people began to relax a little bit. And then we we really began to become effective in terms of working together and really, you know, driving the organization to a point where, you know, within three years of, of my arrival in Brunei, you know, the organization was winning uh, quite a prestigious award in Asia for, for a corporate turnaround. And then in the following year, uh, because we rebranded the airline as well during that period, uh, Royal Brunei Airlines, one of, one of the prestigious um, world's top rebranding awards. So there were a lot of very positive achievements, but it did take time and people had to be patient. Yeah, brilliant. I really, really like hearing that uh, that story and <laughs> maybe others listening to this in their own businesses or startups and or big organizations might might uh, resonate for them as well. I'm going to switch forward a little bit uh, or maybe even back in time. I'm, I'm, we're kind of jumping around, but I have a question that I'm, I'm interested to get your perspective on. When you took over the CEO role of Erlingus, obviously a, a massive accolade to have shortly after that it went public right it, it, it floated was it was it shortly after you took over that role well let me ask you a question this way uh, Aer Lingus has been around for quite a long time well over 80 years now mm-hmm. but if you were to pick the four most tumultuous years <laughs> in the entire history of the organization <laughs> then that was the period when, when I was CEO because you're quite right but when I started in uh, August 2005 the government had a clear agenda to privatize the airline and to begin the process of divesting shares into the into the public stock market. Right. So within 18 months of me joining, after a very considerable effort on the part of people internal within the organization, but also at government level too, we managed to complete the privatization process. But then within four days, literally, of Aer Lingus being quoted on the Dublin and London stock markets, um, Ryanair launched, as only they can, a, a surprise and quite hostile uh, takeover bid. So it was it was an absolutely tumultuous time uh, to be involved. Uh, it was a privilege, but I won't say it was easy because it wasn't. It was immensely challenging. Uh, 
uh, I can I can certainly imagine I can't understand. Uh, I I read uh, again in research. I think there was an article online still from 2006, around the time of the flotation. There was a day in the life of Dermot Mannion and going to bed at 3 a.m. up at six and had a quite a hectic schedule. One thing that I took a note on was selling, and and you were trying to almost sell sell the airline to. You went on a world tour. It said you were trying to to sell effectively stocks and, and shares. I suppose of the airline was selling a skill that you had developed or was it something that you had always within you well again an, another interesting uh, interesting question I, I, I suppose i'd answer it this way i believe i have good presentation skills okay so for instance you know if there's a need to go in and uh, address a group of people on a particular subject and hold their attention for 15 or 20 minutes in so doing right uh, I think I'm quite good at that. Did I get a great deal of training in that area? If I'm absolutely honest, not really. Although, when I look back on it now, one very significant thing that I did do many years ago um, when I was uh, just a young trainee accountant in Dublin hmm. was I joined the Toastmasters organization. Yes. And I spent a couple of very enjoyable years with them and uh, as you probably know, Toastmasters works on the basis that it helps you to develop your public speaking skills. And uh, I enjoyed it enormously. I mean, uh, you are given a particular topic in the Toastmasters group and you're told, go away and think about it for a week and then come back and, and give us a presentation on it in the next meeting. And then there are three or four people in the audience who will give a kind of critique of what you've had to say and how you've said it. Uh, now, it can be quite, uh, you know, onerous and quite difficult, but very, very effective in terms of, you know, developing and improving your presentation skills. And then they also did a sort of impromptu speaking thing where from time to time in meetings, uh, they would simply, you know, as one of the members there, somebody would sort of point to you and say, stand up and talk for five minutes on the following subject. Yeah. And off you go. And and if you repeat yourself, then you're disqualified. And there are certain rules and so on. Sure. But that was enormously beneficial in terms of helping, you know, to, to uh, how to think on your feet. Because, of course, in set piece presentations, although you've, you know, you've got all your material prepared and so on, that's fine. But then at the end, there's always going to be a and a And with the Q&A, there's always that unexpected intervention or that unexpected question from somebody. And you've got to be ready for it. So um, I'm not so familiar with the Toastmasters organization these days. Yeah. But certainly from my time, it, it's an experience that I would heartily recommend. One we use in, in my organization uh, and internally. And obviously there's lots of um, Toastmasters groups all over the, over the country. Massively beneficial for people to uh, to go through the program. I think you have to do 10 speeches to get some sort of uh, certification at the end of that. But yeah, totally, totally agree. It's it's a good call out that people should look to, to do, especially if they have a fear in public speaking, which which an awful lot of people do. I'd love to very briefly just on, on the CEO role with Erlingus. Was there one or two major things that you took away from that as, as a learning, as a, a life lesson or, or a career lesson that you were able to apply in, in the next role, in the Brunei role, or, or even now in your consulting business that helps you with Aer Lingus was a one-off in many ways. Uh, I mean, not only was there a job of work to be done as CEO, but the media scrutiny and the media attention associated with it was incredible. I, I remember uh, on one occasion, somebody had um, you know, created a statistic which said that in a particular year, Aer Lingus gets more media attention in broadcast media and print media than all of the financial institutions in Ireland combined. So if you take all of the banks mm. and all the media that they would get in an average year, then Aer Lingus gets uh, as much of that combined. I mean, it's incredible. So in that sense, I suppose, um, the, the, the biggest learning for me uh, in Aer Lingus was that it's not just enough to be doing the right things in the job itself. Mm you have to manage the external dimension as well so that those outside the organization fully understand exactly what it is you're, that you're doing. And that can be very difficult right. at a time when, you know, as I say, there's a tremendous amount of 
media focus and media attention. So managing the internal challenges and managing the external challenges, uh, I found, and I think anyone in a public role like that would find very, very difficult, but it's very necessary. People often underestimate the external uh, elements associated with a job like that, but it is very, very important because there are so many stakeholders mm -hmm. that have an interest in an organization like Aer Lingus. You have uh, the government, you have the shareholders, you have the passengers, you have the staff, you have business interests in Ireland who, you know, clearly look to Aer Lingus to provide uh, air links with as many cities and jurisdictions as possible. So there's a huge uh, number of different constituents there. And really, you have to focus a certain amount of your time and allocate your time so that you can uh, address the interests of, of each of those constituencies in turn and do it properly. Not an easy task when you're under pressure, I can tell you. No, absolutely. And the, the the thing just around that external media focus, was, was this the first time in your career where you had a role that was very much focused, uh, getting a lot of media attention? You, you know, your name is probably in the paper, on the news on a very regular basis. There was a lot of spotlight on you. Does that just become part of the day job after a while? Do you forget almost that, that that's happening? Do, do you become immune to it? Well, the, the way that I forgot... Uh, or tried to forget that that's happening is that I actually stopped listening to the news. For, for instance, when, when I would drive into work in the morning or going home in the evening, the last thing I would do is put on the radio news because they may well be discussing, you know, some aspect of the Aer Lingus privatization or any, any, any other aspect of the business that may be going on. So I, I simply shut it out, really. And uh, so my period driving to and from work in the car was my little oasis of peace. And, and by the way, I, that's a tip that I would give to anyone. Uh, you know, in, in these days of noise and social media clutter and so on, driving along in your car with the radio switched off is a wonderful opportunity to just think. And, you know, we get so few of those opportunities now that, you know, that was a key learning I took from that period and something that I've done ever since. I, I seldom listen to the radio now in the car. When I'm going along, uh, I try to use time effectively to think through, you know, a project that I might be preparing for or a presentation that I've got in mind or whatever it might be. And it's it can be a very, very productive period of time. I think it's been five years or so since I had the radio on in the car. It just gives you that headspace. And, and I think it also, on, on the flip side, when when it was happening, and even though I wasn't in the media, <laughs> there wasn't any negative press coming my way, I would just probably feel negative by the end of a, of a drive to work, hearing a lot of the, the, the negative sentiment that is coming out about whatever. It just it, it certainly gets into under, under the skin. So no, I, I agree there. On top of that, going through the, the coaching diploma you Andrew and, and Fabio would have talked a good bit about being mindful and meditation we had Grattan on, on it as well is there anything that 20 minutes or 30 minutes silence you had in the car was kind of being a bit mindful was it a practice or is there a practice is there other te techniques you apply to come down out of your head and just be sometimes well I, I'm, I'm a believer in, in, in mindfulness I suppose uh, these days it might be considered somewhat old fashioned but uh, I do pray from time to time, and I find that uh, very effective and, and very mindful and very helpful in just in terms of uncluttering the mind and getting me ready for the challenges ahead. And, and, and certainly, you know, over my life, I, I have found that to be a very effective tool for just uncluttering and preparing for what comes next. Mm. No, that's it's true. I, I, I think meditation and mantra-based type chanting is a you know effectively in a way a form of prayer because if you're saying a similar prayer over and over it can kind of make you focus on just what what's right there in front of you the stresses and strains of all these roles dermot how did you bring balance to all of that what did you do for release or how did you manage your career from that perspective i believe i have the ability to switch off when when i leave the office and and, uh, and go home uh, i'm very interested in music um I've been known to sing in choirs from time to time, which I find enormously enjoyable and a great diversion away from the normal day-to-day -day chores of business. 
Uh, I very much enjoy uh, the movies. I enjoy reading. Uh, I'm something of a sports fanatic. Uh, I have a lot of, of interests away from the workplace that uh, you know tend to keep me energized and uh, refreshed. And of course, family. And it's always wonderful to be able to spend time with family away from work and uh, enjoy what's going on with other members of the family at particular periods of time. Sounds like a nice balance. I'm going to ask three quick final ones to wrap up, uh, Dermot. What does a typical day look like for you now? Well, now I'm in a, a sort of a consultancy role. Mm -hmm. So I'm involved in a number of different uh, projects. So there isn't really a typical working day for me at the moment. I mean, just now, for instance, I'm involved in an advisory capacity on two startup aviation projects, one of which is located uh, in Dublin. Uh, this is a new company uh, developing uh, enhancements to the air traffic management systems uh, and something that we've got uh, high hopes for in terms of success. And there's another uh, startup uh, business which uh, is uh, coming out of India that I also have an advisory role in currently. And uh, that's something that I'm focused on. And again, we have high hopes for the potential for success there. But, you know, startups are, it's a risky business. And, you know, some of them work and some of them don't. But I'm enjoying the experience uh, very, very much. And also, um, I operate in an advisory capacity with an organization called Expert Deal Closer. Uh, expertdealcloser.com, I think, is, is the website address. And basically, as the name suggests, uh, this is an organization that is um, focused on improving negotiating skills right. in the business community. Okay. And uh, contract negotiations and negotiations generally uh, are something that I've spent a lot of time in my working life engaged in. So I'm delighted to be an advisor to uh, www.expertdealcloser.com. And for instance, in the summer, uh, we're hoping to offer a three-day program, uh, which will be run out of the Trinity Business School, uh, all about the art of negotiation. And I'm very much looking forward to participating in that. And indeed, if it works well in Dublin, then we have hopes of perhaps taking it to other parts of the world uh, as well. So that's uh, that, that's another big activity that I'm currently engaged in. So I suppose those are the three mm. uh, predominant issues that I, are bouncing around in my life at the moment. As well as that, I still haven't forgotten, of course, the coaching that we talked about earlier. Yeah, I do uh, some coaching and mentoring activity as well as that. So it's it's a pretty uh, varied um, routine, shall we say. And no one day is like any other day. And hopefully I can keep it that way. A nice variety there, Dermot. I'm, I'm jealous. The, the coaching, I will wrap it up. And in the when I put out the episode notes, um, a, a reference to the expert dealcloser.com. People can check that out. If people wanted to get in touch with you as well, I'm happy to, to share any links or, or email addresses if you if you wanted to, to do that. I'd like to ask folks about a book that they would recommend that they've read that had a, a big impact on them, not necessarily just recently or, or over the course of your career. Any Anyone jump out? Oh, you've caught me cold now. <laughs> um, well, I, I'll, answer, I'll answer it this way. Um, the, the uh, I haven't read the book, but I've seen the movie The Shawshank Redemption. Oh, and, yes. and that was one of the finest pieces of work that I, I've ever seen. Yeah, There's a line in there which I particularly love, the one that says, hope is a good thing. Maybe the best of things and good things never die. And I really like that line. I think it's, you know, when all else fails, there's always hope. Yeah, really, really good. Very last one, and it's a bit light as well. If you were to bring two people to dinner and not not necessarily anyone, maybe family or, or friends, so some people you might have been influenced by or, or admired over the years, uh, any two jump to mind and any, any particular reason? Oprah Winfrey would be one. Okay. Uh, she's a, a remarkable lady who's had a tremendous influence uh, on the world. Hmm. And the second one, uh, sadly, he's no longer with us. It would be posthumous, but it probably would be um, Pope John Paul II. That would be a very interesting trio of people, myself and those two for dinner. <laughs> well, yeah. That, that would was... be quite a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, it's a nice way to, to end it. Maybe leave that image in your own mind there as, as we wrap up. Dermot, look, it's been a really fascinating hour listening to your many nuggets of information wisdom knowledge that you've shared i'm really looking forward to listening to it back and writing writing furiously uh, some notes and i'd just like to say again thanks so much for for giving up the time uh, tonight hey, it's a pleasure and can i just say for the benefit of your, of your listeners if there's anybody who wants to be in touch uh, i'm on linkedin so you can find me there very easily Dermot, yeah, I'll absolutely put that link into the to notes and hopefully people will uh, will hear the episode and enjoy it and, and get in touch as a result. Okay, well, listen, thank you very much and uh, all the best to your listeners as well. Brilliant, Dermot. Thanks so much. Have a good evening now, Rob. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. How was that? Did you enjoy it? I hope so. If you did, please like, share and do all that other good stuff that only takes a second on social media but means an awful lot to me as it spreads the reach. You can get the details from the show in the show notes on the website robofthegreen.ie. In there you can share the show out with others i really just want to touch on three other quick things one feedback i learned so much from it without it i can't improve please give me a bit of feedback positive negative constructive would you recommend a book do you have any other ideas for guests how about more video let me know what you want and i can make it happen i will try that's number one number two sharing is caring this year i'm making more of an effort to try and expand the reach facebook there's a page and there's a group the one percent better community on facebook is where i really hope new listeners go to share ideas comments in general things that they could help others with that's what it's there for follow me on spreaker.com that's the new host i'm on twitter growing not exponentially at all but slowly so please follow there i'm on instagram all of these are at rob of the green linkedin rob o'donnell get in touch would love to hear from you number three is about support so i'm offering a few hours a month pro bono free coaching to those that can't afford it that need some coaching that want some coaching if you go to the website the support page click on the pro bono link on the flip side of that where you guys can support me go to patreon.com the rob of the green page you can make a donation there you can get access to exclusive content which i'm adding all the time that would be awesome anything you contribute will go back into the show to make it better make it more than one percent better also there's the option to buy one of those books that were recommended through the website which will bring you to Amazon, which will get you the normal links, which will get you the books at the normal price. But supposedly, Amazon will give the show a small donation every time a book is purchased or anything for that matter, which is great. So finally, I just wanted to say thanks so much for listening. I know it's difficult to make improvements, to push things forward, to get outside your comfort zone. I'm trying to do it all the time. I hope that every listen and every show and every guest that is on gives you something to take away that you could apply, adopt and adapt into your own life to create a new habit, to make something better. Don't overreach. Small improvements. 1% is enough. And thank yourself for making the time to listen to the show. It shows you're interested in learning, improving and getting better, even if it's just 1% at a time. Have a great day and good luck.